In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Have you ever listened to the radio station, to a station where people call in to talk about their problems? It can be something like a, a difficult divorce, or a grudge that they're holding with a coworker that they won't let go of. Or they could even just be distressed at the amount of violence that's in the world. Then the radio host will tell them exactly what they're lacking in order to solve their problem. Usually it's something like honesty, respect, or compassion. You're given the impression that if you just did whatever they told you to do, your life would immediately be better. Our sermon text for this evening comes from a section of Nicodemus and Jesus speaking to each other. And if Nicodemus were alive today, I'd imagine he'd be one of those people who called in to radio show stations. He had problems, and he had questions, and he was looking for answers. Questions like, why do I feel guilty even though I work as hard as I do? When I die, am I going to heaven or to hell? These are questions that we struggle with today. But because they didn't have radio, Nicodemus went to Jesus, the carpenter from Nazareth who had shocked the Palestinian world with his teachings and his miracles. John the Baptist had done a good job of advertising Jesus, the Lamb of God, as someone who could help you with your problems. So Nicodemus and Jesus met at night, secretly, because Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin who opposed Jesus. How do you think Jesus' answers compared to the answers we hear on the radio station? Were they full of three tips for a better faith or five ways to be closer to Jesus? Did they seem immediately applicable to daily life? No, not at face value. But did you also hear Christ's answer to Nicodemus's questions? It focuses us in on John 3:16, one of the most important and well-known verses of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This verse contains the answer to all of our questions. When we first hear this verse, we tend to focus on God so loved the world. But for us to fully understand what it means that God loved the world, we have to focus first on the word perish. Do you know what it means to perish? To really perish, to suffer God's punishment forever and to be cut off from any good thing that comes from his hand. None of us really know what it's like to perish, and I hope that none of us ever find out. But we do know about suffering and pain here on earth, and maybe that suffering and pain can start to give us an idea of what it means to perish. We suffer when we get the diagnosis of cancer, when someone lies about us and we have to live with an undeserved reputation, when, when even we do something stupid and we have to live with the consequences of that action. Death, broken relationships, all of these things cause pain. Sometimes, I think we become numb to the pain, numb to our own pain and to the pain of others. Other times, it's not so easy. Have you ever had one of those days where your body physically ached because of the stress of daily life? Or one of those days where 
everybody's talking about the sunshine, but all you can see are clouds on the horizon. There is pain and suffering all around us. You just need to tune into world news or national news or local news, and you'll find story after story of people and accidents and disease causing pain. Why? Why is all this pain and suffering in the world? You cannot blame God. No, all this pain and suffering is in the world because of sin. There are obvious examples like physical abuse or infidelity, but even the little things, holding a grudge until it starts to eat away inside of you, or the laziness that causes someone else to pick up your slack. In fact, I dare you to come up with a sin that doesn't cause suffering. And what about all those things that don't seem directly related to sin? The accidents and natural catastrophes and just the drudgery of everyday life. Well, these are in the world because of Adam's sin and the curse that was placed on the world because of sin entering into it. Ultimately, every problem on earth comes from sin. Yours, mine, and others. But all that pain and suffering in the whole world is only a drop in the ocean compared to the pain and suffering of hell. The pain and suffering of perishing forever. We all deserve to perish because of our sins. And that is the bad news. Now are you ready for the good news? God does not want you to perish. God loves you. In fact, God loves the whole world. That's amazing. If you think about this world that's full of people who hate and despise God, full of people who hate and despise and just make life miserable for one another. If you had a perfect world in one hand and this world in the other hand, would you really love this world? Not really. This world is ugly. This world is perverse. This world is disgusting. But God chose this world. And you and I are a part of this world. That means that God loves us. With all our faults and imperfections, with all the times we cause suffering for each other, God still loves us. That too just boggles the mind. But wait just a moment, the skeptic might say. God loves us, but so what? There's still pain and suffering in the world. And he'd be right to ask the question, so what? I'm sure we can think of times that someone has said, I love you, and then hurt us because all they wanted was something for themselves. Or times where someone has said, I love you, but not really meant anything by it. How can you tell if someone loves you? Real love is not just words. Real love is also expressed in what you do. And what more could God do than to give us his son? Jesus compares himself to the bronze snake that was lifted up in the desert in Moses' time. Jesus would also be lifted up and crucified, and not just to die an earthly death. No, on the cross, Jesus perished. That word perish, that means the oceans of suffering that we deserve for our sin. Jesus experienced this fully on the cross. All of that pain and all of that suffering came flooding in on him as he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This 
is how wide and long and deep and high the love of God is. And it's all yours. You don't have to do anything for it. Jesus compares himself to the bronze serpent. And just like the bronze serpent was lifted up, there's another point of comparison. People would think it foolish that looking at a bronze serpent would heal you from a snake bite. In the same way, on our own, we think the cross is foolishness. But God knows this. And God gives us the gift of faith in his word and in baptism and in holy supper. We do not do anything. God has given us life through Christ's death. You see, nowhere is God's love seen more clearly than in what it could have been. It's opposite rejection. God so loved the world means that he did not reject the world. Instead, he picks us up in hands that are still dripping with blood, and he holds us as if we were his one and only child. He willingly protects us in Christ's embrace of perfection so that on the last day, Satan's accusations can do nothing to us. He tracks our lives like a military planner, knowing every moment of every day. His angels are always by our side, and his hearing is so acute that it even hears our unspoken sighs. This was Christ's answer to Nicodemus's question, far different from the advice you hear on radio talk shows that say, you have to live right and then your life will be right. And far more effective. Your earthly problems are resolved only by fully understanding, fully believing the triune God's love for an imperfect world. We will not perish. God has taken away our sin, and we will live forever. But what about the suffering we still endure here on earth? We can first look at his love for us. See the proof of his love and the great self-sacrifice he made for us. Then, can you also trust him to use this earthly pain and suffering for our good? He has promised to do just that. And when it gets particularly difficult, we can come back to this verse and to others like it, which remind us of how God's love has already taken care of our greatest need. Besides, isn't that one of the reasons that God sends us suffering? So that we will come running back to him and be strengthened in our faith. One day we will be made perfect, and all pain and sorrow will be gone. The few years we spend on this earth in our present suffering seem like nothing compared to the eternity we will spend with God. There is so much to talk about in this one verse that the few minutes we've spent here are really only a beginning. In fact, it's a good thing that we will live forever because it will take an eternity to fully understand what this verse means. I can think of no better way to close our meditation on these words than to use the very words that Jesus spoke to Nicodemus, John 3.16. Please say John 3.16 with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.